Thank you, as always, for listening to Caleb vs. Self. Today I spoke with Brandon E.V. White, a.k.a. Bushido Garvey. He's got two new albums coming out this summer, summer 2021, uh, Sorry Bill, I'll Pass, uh, a COVID journal, and 30 Rock. We talk about one of the tracks on there very specifically, How You Maga. Uh, We talk about some suggested reading material from him and how not to use people of color for your racial therapy. Um, His insight into that as well as his music are, are excellent. So much depth and so much nuance that's there to be found i highly recommend checking them out you can check him out at uh, any social media platform at bushido garvey or at myaclaude.com keep posting keep checking those albums will drop this summer super excited to listen to the rest of the tracks on there and as always i hope you enjoy the conversation I already know I said it, but thank you so much for, for taking some time, spending some time with me. Who I have on with me is is Brandon Ev White or Bushido Garvey. Um, in the intro, you'll hear a whole bunch of stuff of, of where you can find a ton of his work. But again, I appreciate you hopping on. Thank you so much, man. Well, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate you reaching out. So I'm going to dive right into it. So the first time I saw anything about you was from the Rochester City newspaper, and it talked about how you MAGA. Or how you MAGA, yeah. depending on your right vernacular or how you pronounce that. And no when I listened to the song and I started reading it, like the first thing that pulled me to it is um, it's it's very raw. Like it's very in your face. Like this is what it is. There's no hiding this. What yeah. was it about 45 or the Trump era that really pushed the direction of this song and how you wrote it? You know, it's funny. It's the 45 era, um, it wasn't so much of the 45 era. It was so much of what we chose to forget because of the 45 era. Um, Trump was what America has always been. Just it showed its more crass side, right? It showed its less sophisticated, oppressive side, right? The oppressive model that America has been upgrading with from the, I would argue from the 80s and 90s into the 2000s, was one that was a lot more sophisticated, right? Um, it was one that was moving away from an obvious kind of Jim Crowish kind of uh, 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 style of oppression, just unapologetic, in your face, really emotional type of, of, of prejudice, bigotry, and systemic racism. Um, but it was moving away from that over the past 20, 25 years. But then Trump pops up. And he's back with the old school kind of racism. Not that it's radically, uh, keyword on radically, not that it's radically different than any of the racism and colonialism, right, and oppression that took place in any of the other administrations before, but it was a lot more crass, right? It, it was a lot more uh, unapologetic. Um, right. It was a lot more Jim Crow and less gerrymandered. You know what I'm saying? Like <clears throat> a lot more clandestine. Um, yeah. A lot so, more. Uh, so for you, does that does that push the the song itself? The, like how you want to be so forward with it and so upfront with it? Is that kind of the yeah the, the opposite effect? The mm-hmm. definitely like um. So you know there are two there are two maga songs. The one is a how you maga a reflection, which is kind of like has like a jazzy lighthearted uh, production to it, but then like some of the messages are harder hidden, but you don't really always sense it or feel it unless you're really paying attention. And then How You Maga, the remix uh, subtitled It's Not Over, is the one that's really, really in your face. <clears throat> and, you know, like the, 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 the frustration with America not being able to decode itself unless it's super obvious was, is present in both of those versions, right? There, there's a little more optimism in the original. And then the other one is a little bit more indicting, a little more angry, and a little bit more um, reflective of my own uh, complicity, right? Because the last couple lines are, um, uh, what's it called? What are the last couple lines? I should do long lines off the top of my head. Um, Got this my ones, my 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 Jordan Air ones. My ones were made in Bangladesh. My iPhone was made in Zhangzhou. My anger was made in America. Manufacturing contradictions is what this thing's about. 
right? Where, you know, at the end of the day, I can judge and 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 make assessments around what some people do, but then I'm also kind of complicit too, because these people who make my phone or make my shoes uh, through American business and empire don't get paid anywhere close to what we think is unfair here, <laughs> right? Um, right. You know, so I, I get, all those emotions were unpacked with um, both songs, but then you definitely felt it with the remix. There's so much to dissect with everything you said, but but the first thing I think I'm going to pull up is um, your song "False." What was it "False Conscious"? And I think you put that. Oh out wow! You, yeah, you, yeah, you dug in the crates for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's interesting is about that is you're talking about where the line is, right? Mm-hmm. And, and my question to you, and, and what it sounds like you're talking about is where? How do you find that line? Like in that specific verse, you're talking about how on one hand you want to talk, you want to. Um, and, and I might word this poorly, but fight this new racial, whatever the hell it is, pardon my French, but whatever this is. And on the same hand, like I still want my shoes and I still want my iPhone. Like, where do you find that line? Because I feel like mm-hmm. a lot of false conscious is looking for that. Like, how, how do you find that? Um, I think it's a lifelong pursuit and a lifelong meditation. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, because there's always going to be something that enters into your atmosphere, into your environment that challenges your ability to balance uh, what you think is right and fair. So, you know, for example, I've gone back to the shoes point, right? I've gone, you know, years without buying new Jordans for that reason. Right. But then what about this shirt? (laughs) Right. Um, You know, what about, the watch I'm wearing and and the pieces that belong to the watch or anything, right? This desk, right? Like, so there's always something and you have to figure out how to fight the battles that you can fight, but also not use that as an excuse to be super lenient on, on your ideas of oppression and what's right and what's wrong. And in the case of a false conscious, it's, that was more about like, some things I was seeing where, where folks were, I was noticing folks were using their newfound information to be oppressive. Um, like they had, they had information, but the way their brain was working with that information was the same as it would be working without it. So instead of being, um, <laughs> instead of using the information to kind of change shady thinking or behavior you just have shading thinking and behavior with new information right um so that's kind of what that song was about and also kind of wrestling with perceptions of whatever being woke is or conscious is um that may not necessarily be uh you know fit that exact mold but like at the end of the day consciousness is this very flexible malleable kind of concept that can manifest in a lot of different ways it just depends on whatever your context is right so <clears throat> um, I, I tend to talk about this idea of of, of like <laughs> I tend to like have this satirical kind of analysis of the idea of being woke in fact one of my songs is called woke cane right like <laughs> because we tend to treat like information and being woke like a drug it's like a new drug in the 21st century mm-hmm. um, where you can tweet something real quick you feel good about it and, um, you know, like that becomes your that becomes your new addiction and you don't necessarily have to uh, show fruit of that new information. Right. Like, how did you change your family? How did you change your community? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you change yourself other than being able to tweet something out? Right. Like it's just it's become our new drug as opposed to our uh, new lifestyle sometimes. So the, I, I tend to be real critical on that of myself and our society too, because I know I can get caught up on some old cane myself. <laughs> a lot of your, or and I could be wrong, but a lot of your criticisms in a lot of your music and what you talk about tend to be about your community specifically. What I find yeah. interesting with what you just said is that it also impacts this uh, community that was begat, or or I should say resurrected by 45 too, because you have this whole QAnon ridiculousness and, and what you said was the same thing, right? I don't have to prove essentially or validate with actual evidence the things that I am saying. And that seems to be as true for this QAnon slash, I don't know what you want to call it, 
as well as for the the uber woke community. And I think one of your lines somewhere, and I could be wrong, but it was something to the effect of, uh, and I actually it was in False Conscious the the line where it's um, you know the difference between woke and just insomnia or something to that mm-hmm. effect. Like where yep. you know that's again that that thin line of you know what is going too far. But I like this idea of of okay, cool, you tweeted the tweet, but how does that help your family, your community? What are you actually doing? Um, at a grassroots level to impact those around you. And that's a lot of, I feel like, what you talk about in a lot of your your music. Definitely. Um, yeah. It, it was really interesting to see over the past four years, like before, the, like, you know, the, what we call liberal or left wing, right? Those are the conspiracy people, right? Before 45. During 45, we saw the right and the conservative wing of the of of the American political spectrum be deemed and embrace in conspiracy uh, theory, and you know, and back to Hayumaga, I said uh, Trump was the Joker, right? Um, Trump, and I don't know how closely you follow those comics, and I myself am I'm kind of a novice with <clears throat> uh, the DC universe, but it, one thing's very clear: the Joker along with just being a maniac himself, really reveals the flaws of Gotham's society. Like, Mm -hmm. one, just because Gotham made the Joker, that's flaw number one. And then flaw number two, um, he kind of illustrates the flaws of, like, the people who say they're about good, like the Gotham Police Department. Like, every interaction with the Joker, there's always something that reveals about the corruption that exists in the politics and in the, uh, the, 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 the the police wing of Gotham, right? So with Trump, he was out of his mind, but he was also revealing how dirty this, this the, uh, the, the, the system was, right? Because the same system made Trump and the people who say that they're on the good side of it and the flip side of it against Trump, they have their own mess as well, right? Like, and, you know, I'm not saying that Biden is characteristically or even politically like Trump. I'm not saying they have the same views. But sure, this man sure, has sure. gotten, yeah, like, you know, this this man does not have a squeaky clean record about his own personal comments about race, nor has his legislation been clean around race and racial relations, right? This man is seen having conversations kind of apologizing for Southern racists that had been in <clears throat> uh, Congress for years. Like, oh, he was never mean to me, right? Like, so... How much right. better really are you, right? Like maybe you're not the Joker, but you're still part of the of the sick environment that could birth a Joker. And then you look at the Joker and say he's an aberration. And really, he's just your id. And that was another thing in the first MAGA song. I said yes. um, elected the country's id's what we did. We didn't elect some sort of entity from outside this country. That's a part of our psychology, our id, our ego, and our super ego. I feel like the people who sit in Congress pointing their finger at Trump are like the ego and or the super ego of the country. And Trump's just the id. He's just a different part of the American uh, psychosis, <laughs> right? And so for the other people to kind of, you know, look at, thumb their nose at this man, when you yourself, you know, have contributed to terrible immigration policy, you yourself have contributed to terrible global regime change wars. You yourself have contributed to gerrymandering and rigging your own elections that way, right? And rigging the D- Democratic National Convention that way. You're not mm-hmm. radically better than this scumbag, <laughs> right? So, you know, like I, I love really exploring that, but then I also like exploring my own complicity, right? And in terms of how messy it is trying to navigate all that, right? Because um, it's hard. It's hard, you know, and I like to let people know that it's it's hard and, and what are the things we can be looking at in the process. And that seems to be a lifelong goal for you, right, is to continually yeah. challenge yourself to say, OK, I'm going to I'm going to talk about all the stuff that I see. But I also have to look at myself at the same time and make sure that, you know what I'm saying, I'm, I'm practicing what I'm preaching. And what I like about it is that you're not holding back on yourself. You're You're brutally honest to say. Again, I'll point back to that line that you said, like my my iPhone, like I still have an iPhone. It's not like I threw it away. Um, mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate that. And one of the things um, that you had said is uh, 
uh, as far as your teaching, I'm going to change gears just a little bit here, but um, you aren't an effective teacher unless you are a permanent student. Is that part of that whole like thought process for you is to continue to make sure that you are constantly learning no matter what? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't even remember when I said that. Um, but yeah, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll no. send it to you later. Don't worry. You said, yeah, it. no, I appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> it. Well, yeah, no, that, I, I mean, um, I just don't get how you can educate anybody without ever, without, you know, learning yourself constantly, you know, um, it, it's just, it, it, at this juncture, it just makes a lot of sense. Um, I, so I there's probably a lot of context there that I'm missing with asking that question. So I'll, I'll move on a little bit. But one of the yeah. things on your Instagram post that you put up recently was a certificate of completion for a core online yes. elementary reading academy. And that seems to also flow right in with that philosophy of continuing to be a student. How important is reading to you? Um, and, and where is it that you get that specifically from? Was it your mom being a librarian? Is that where a lot of that comes from or? I think, um, and I'll try to answer because I feel like I did a not so good job answering your first. So I'll try to answer both with this. That's one. okay. Um, <laughs> I believe it came from, it, 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 there are a couple of points. One, mm -hmm. you're, you're right. Mother's a librarian, right? There are always books around the house. Um, and even, even, you know, just as early as I can remember outside of school being taught, uh, letters and letter sounds and, you know, being taught to sound it out, even when I wasn't really trying to focus, like my father would tell me, focus, <laughs> it'll sound this out, right? Like, so the always being around books, always seeing them, even having pictures of the house of people reading, right? Like there was always a culture of that, even when I was not that interested in reading and or writing, right? Um, so there is that default culture. And then I guess like around, you know, coming of age, 13 or so, maybe 12, my aunt actually gave me for my birthday or Christmas, a subscription to Vibe Magazine. So at this point, I'm still telling myself, I ain't really trying to read like that, but I'm reading all these magazines, right? And, and I don't know how familiar you are with hip hop uh, magazine literature, but it's actually it's it's very sophisticated and it has a lot of uh you know complex meaning language nuances um you know knowledge demands that you have to you know master et cetera et cetera so I'm actually you know being pushed not just like reading fluff I'm actually being pushed you know uh with my capacities to to read complex literature and uh text <clears throat> all while really developing my hip hop identity. Um, but then all this time still, as I'm growing and I'm learning and I'm reading, I'm not realizing that part of my education didn't really necessarily prepare me for the mechanics of reading like hyper well. And I'll spare, I'll, I'll spare the whole story because I know there's a lot of interview questions, but basically, I don't know how old you are, but if you're like 30-ish, between 30 and 40, chances are high, you got something called whole language instruction, which didn't necessarily teach you the mechanics of letters and letter sounds. It was more like, okay, familiarize yourself with loose concepts of sounds, the alphabet, and get you exposed to a lot of words, and you'll kind of pick it up. Basically, okay. you learn, you get some knowledge, and you get more curious, and then you'll kind of pick up the code of the English language that way. But the science doesn't the science doesn't show that that's the most effective way of reading. And so generations of folks were not taught the explicit science of reading. And that's why there could be so many functionally illiterate or partially literate adults. Um, mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> knowing this and even knowing before this that a major part of my people's oppression was this allowing the interpretation of the English written word, it made me want to be an English teacher. Uh, on top of all the other things I was seeing my culture and hip hop um, do with the English language, right? Um, you know, um, so which, which uh, I'm sorry, I got to say this, which also is not the most poetic of languages from the rip anyway. 
I think people have to understand that like English is the most convoluted, contradictory language out there, right? Like it's the worst. when you, when it's when, the worst. It, 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 when you yeah, it's it's crazy. And you know what's funny? It, it's funny, not funny when we see a lot of these racist folks empowered by the Joker, AE forty five. Uh, you know, get mad at people for speaking Spanish, right? When Spanish, the rules for Spanish are so much more uniform mm -hmm. <laughs> and so much more just consistent than this crazy English language, which this is a, just a mutton variety of like all these other languages, right? So <clears throat> I feel like what we did with the English language is the same thing we did with soul food, right? Where mm. we took these crazy pieces of dietary pieces, right? Along with some other th other things that we brought from, uh, you know, our ancestors' homes, our uh, the, uh, the mother continent, and mixed all that up and created this amazing flavor. And we did the same thing with the English language. We took this crazy, like, nonsensical kind of <laughs> uh, language and added some of our own kind of cultural linguistic norms to it and mixed it up to create some amazing literature, amazing stories, and amazing music. And I wanted to be a part of that legacy of creating that and also exposing that to the students and kids. Because I had to put two and two together about the connections between hip hop and what I was learning in my English classroom. I had to do that for me. You know, um, I know that doesn't happen. Teachers don't always do that. Right, and they don't always make the cultural, deep cultural connections to literature and to music and to poetry, uh, the way that it could, or, or to socio political matters, um, the way that they could. So I wanted to make sure I did that when I when I came of age. And what's interesting is that you were you were I mean you say specifically in the post like neither of the degree programs you went through taught you the science of reading either. So obviously this mm -hmm. from a personal, cultural, professional on so many different levels, it was so important to you to make sure that you um, had that base understanding. And, and you talk about hip hop. Um, I, I don't I was about to say literature. I mean, it is written word. It can be written word. But the way that and for this interview, I tried to do a little bit of homework and I ran across a guy called Stevie Knight on YouTube who does a really good job at trying to break down is going to sound ridiculous, but break down bars for people like me who I don't have that cultural context. I don't have that that background to really understand the triple entendres, the double entendres, all the things, the, 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 what is it? Alliterations, all the, you know, there's so many different things going on in hip hop lyrics. And it's interesting because like you said, there's, there's, there's kind of a wall there between, you know, the standard English language and how artists like yourselves and other are like you and others are able to use the English language to paint such a vivid picture, but not just one picture, potentially two or three pictures in the same verse is just mind blowing for me. Where is it that you feel like in your lyrics that you try to push the envelope, you know, lyrically? Do you focus on trying to get double entendres? Do you focus on specific, like, uh, you know, you did a, in one of your songs, you did a uh, Hornet B honeycomb wordplay type of thing. And, and, I probably missed, you know, 80% of what you put out there, to be honest, but I tried. I did give it an honest I effort, I promise. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate it. Um, my favorite hip-hop artists growing up were the type of hip-hop artists where you could listen to a song countless times, but then the seventh year of you listening to the song, you find out something new. And then seven years after that, you find something new. So I always wanted to, you know, mirror that and, um, you know, double entendres, are, are, are a major uh, key part of that. And I've always played with the level of depth that I'll do that with, right? Um, I've been trying to flirt with being less like that, but I, it, it doesn't work. I always end up like going like on the on the deeper end of the spectrum with, with that type of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I'm not sure if you noticed, but in that first MAGA song, there are several spellings that I commit to in that song of MAGA, right? So, so you know, we know MAGA for being Make America Great Again, right? Yes. But, yep. um, you know, when you look at the lyrics or listen to the lyrics, you know, I said, uh, I, I say, um, make America God again. 
right? So that's another MAGA, a freedom fetish rhetoric without charges of fraudulence, here to make America's grand audience. That's another MAGA. We believe the deflection of us at our naughtiest. Trump made America the gaudiest again. So that's another MAGA, made America the gaudiest again. He's ain't see white folks golden calf. And that's, the, you know, taking desert chances, waiting on the tablets, about to make America go acrid. So it goes, so uh, in addition to the entendres, there's the parables and there's the actual like kind of wordplay around like flipping the acronym, right? Um, so I'll be honest, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, there, there's like at least so many. You know, to your yeah. point, there's such a depth to these. Like, not only do you have your actual message that you're getting across, but there mm-hmm. is the wordplay. There's how it's written. There's there's the enunciation of words. Like, there's so many different things happening that what I've in this journey, what I've appreciated so far about hip hop is that genuine level of depth that goes unappreciated, I think, by most people like myself is outrageous because most other songs, I mean, typically I just listen to podcasts. I, I like listening yeah. to people talk. But to find out and to see how far someone can take a verse is crazy. And just, I feel like it's just so unappreciated. And it makes me understand why there are hip hop heads. I was like, oh, you know, hip hop, it's country music, it's rock music, it's all music. Like they have a message, you hear it, it, it has a cool beat, and then you move on. No, that is, I feel like, not the case when you get a chance to dive into a lot of of what I think I understand to be really good hip hop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, another point of reference for you, I would encourage you to go on genius. Um, genius is a website. It's basically like a wiki site that kind of is like a database for a lot of artists, uh, lyrics and people go in and annotate the meanings and the definitions and the double entendres and the uh, allusions and references and all that <clears throat> breaking the lyrics down. Um, I actually threw my lyrics up there as well. <clears throat> um, but obviously, like, because, and that's the thing, it's like, it's like a wiki, right? Where anybody can add uh, artists, lyrics, and or commentary on other people's artists. So everybody from your most uh, regional rapper <laughs> from Rochester to uh, Jay-Z or the Migos, right? Their lyrics are on there and, and are being interpreted in a very cool and interesting fashion. And Actually, Genius does has YouTube videos called Verified, I believe, where artists, they have artists that are up and coming and or established break down their lyrics as well. So there's a lot of there's a lot of culture and online culture uh, for that. Before you had to just read the lyrics in, 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 a, in, on a, in a CD jacket or you had to read reviews on Vibe or Source or Double XL or whatever have you or the verse of the month. Um, on any of those um, publications, but now there's a whole online culture with that. And it's something that should absolutely be checked out because, like I said, the the skill level and the work is obviously put in there to such a degree that I think is lost upon so many people that if they just yeah. took a few minutes, you know, and that's what I appreciate. And maybe Genius does that really well. I, I'm gonna definitely check that out. I know Stevie Knight does it really really well and he makes it fun at the same time while he's nice. explaining you know a lot of the stuff that goes on so what's interesting yeah. about that is that for me in, in something i've learned through this journey is that having people like that being able to open that door to things that were inaccessible to me and it's it's kind of like how it is with reading right like by yes. reading a book by by absorbing that information doors are opening to you that you might not have even realized exist mm-hmm that's right. And in yeah. that same vein, is there a book that you particularly like a door open for you that just hit you dead square in the face? You're like, oh man. Um, so off the top of you my have head, lots of them. Yeah. You have lots of books. <laughs> yes, no doubt, no doubt. Um I would say two off the top of my head. Um one of them is the Bible. We'll talk about double entendre. <laughs> right. And talk about layers and layers of meaning and, and, and coordinated structure. So it's it's a really powerful book from that example alone, um, let alone the things that can be seriously unlocked from it. And then also in terms of like my like coming of age in, in, in you know, non-religious literature is Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. 
that that book. So remember, I was telling you I was learning about like all these literary devices and noticing like, wait a minute, like you're talking about this person doing it. Like, well, this rapper does that too, right? And it's kind of threading the commonalities together for myself. Yes. Like, Invisible Man was the first book I read that had those types of layers that we're talking about with hip hop. Like every single page had like four layers to it. And and since I was being trained and appreciating that type of hip hop around that time, I'm probably at reaching my height of analyzing in depth, very cryptic and coded lyrics. At that time, I'm like 17, this is like senior year or so, we read Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, and he's doing the same thing, but in a book, as opposed to an album or a song. And I was just like, I I was just like, and again, at this point, I was curious, and I could appreciate what books did or do, but like, I didn't have like the stamina because of like the actual mechanical science. I didn't have that to read such a extensive book as Invisible Man, but because my interest was so peaked and, and these codes were so, you know, mesmerizing, I got through that book. And I remember when we got through it, I was like, wow, this is the longest book I ever read. Um, word, uh, you know, first word to end word um, because it just had that much coding in it and, and it just fascinated me. I have, to, I have to revisit it again. It's been a while. I'm, I just jotted that one down. I'm going to I'm gonna have to check that one out just based on that. Do you have another Instagram post as well about three things that you could read? I believe it was after the movie um, Judas and the Black Messiah, right? There's the FBI yeah. War on Tupac and Black Leaders, Black Panther for Beginners, and Racial Matters, the FBI Secret File on Black America. As somebody mm-hmm. like myself who admittedly doesn't know that much about – Um, the actual Black Panthers and those type of movements, especially during the civil rights movement, which one of those three books would you say, hey, if you're going to read one of them, this is the one I I think you should read? Oh, that's I mean, it it depends on the person. With you, my guess would be the FBI's war on Tupac, the Black Panthers. I believe I believe in the subtitle as well. might have Bob Marley in there, too, Um, just because as a person who's engaged in pop culture, it's a nice bridge. Tupac is an excellent bridge of like pop culture and like the movement because his parents were Black Panthers. Um, mother, very famous and important Black Panther, right? Godfather, also one of the most important Black Panthers, uh, Geronimo Pratt. And you see how that legacy followed him, not, not just like ancestrally or culturally or politically, like the government's terrorism, it followed him throughout his early youth, <laughs> right? Um, to see, you know, how, how uh, radicalized he would be or what his act, activism activities would be, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you see that t- start to spill into the music and pop culture in terms of how closely they're still paying attention to him and how that all kind of connects to an overall uh, governmental terroristic kind of agenda of like stopping, as that movie talks about, the rise of a Black Messiah, the rise of of, of an individual who be able to kind of, you know, rally the folks um, and, and, and not just black folks either. Cause I don't, did you see the movie yet? I haven't. It's on, my okay. wife and I are planning on watching it this weekend. Yeah. One of the things you'll notice about Fred Hampton is like, not only was he able to, you know, unify the Panthers well in his own community well, but he worked at a very intersectional lens, right? Like um, he worked with the uh, Puerto Rican young Lords he worked with, um, what, what were those white dudes called again? I forgot their names. The pro- uh, I want to call them the Proud Boys, but that is not their name. What was their <laughs> name? Young Patriots. Young Patriots. That's what they were okay, called. Okay, okay. Um, and he, he had a very uh, intersectional lens in terms of how to rally the people in, in general. And, and all of this was a threat to the American government. And they, you know, tried to set him up, sabotage him, like put in, you know, moles and and provocateurs and, and, and things of that nature to the point where, you know, spoiler alert, but it's history, you know, he gets killed. Right. Um, you know, so <clears throat> um, that Pac is, it wasn't radically different in those regards in terms of him being young, him being able to unify a lot of people through his music um, and through his like vast walk. Cause he, you know, grew up in New York, but also grew up in Baltimore, but also grew up in the Bay. 
right? Um, had connections in the streets, had connections in the politics, right? Like he was not the same, but like had a lot of similarities with like a Fred Hampton's young, young unifying energy. Um, and the book, the book has receipts for days. What I mean by that is they have a lot of evidence and citations and that kind of show like just, just how crazy our government can be when it comes to uh, not wanting uh, some folks to have power. Yeah, I mean, they it's literally a suppression of social change, regardless mm-hmm. of who it may or may not benefit. At the end of the day, it's about it's about power and it's about who can wield that power. And it doesn't matter to me, at least. And this is coming from my perspective. It doesn't matter what race, creed or color it is to me in this. That might be me being a little ignorant, to be fair. But I think of like Waco in the in the seventh day folks there. I mean, they were all brutally murdered for lack of a better word. Same thing with Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And, and it, I mean, there's just, there's so many different things um, that that to me, and what's interesting about this whole thing is that um, Rage Against the Machine did a video, I think it was with the University of Alabama, where they, where they broke down this idea of white supremacy and where it comes from. And what's interesting about it is that when my ancestors first came here as Irish people, They were Irish. They weren't white, right? Mm -hmm. The Italians were Italian. The Germans were Germans. There wasn't white people in that sense. And the argument that they made is is when you had um, Southern plantations, it was really a bunch of rich white people trying to find commonality with poor white people so they could band together. And I use that in quotation marks because, I mean, at the end of the day, the poor white people, although not enslaved, were still poor white people. You know, you didn't you don't have what they have. And the only thing you have is this image that I look like this person. Therefore, I could be rich one day, which is weird because it's the same almost concept that we have with 45. Like a lot of people see a rich white dude. Oh, well, I'm a white dude and therefore I could be rich one day. So I'm more like this guy rather than being more like my neighbor who's just as poor as I am. But because he's black or he's brown or he's Asian, I don't like him because I identify with somebody who, let's be honest, could give two flying you know what's about me, right? So it yeah. seems to be as time goes on, or at least the more that I read and the more that I see, and some of the things that you have suggested here, I feel like point in that same direction is that it's more about money and power than it is about race or creed or ethnicity. And I wonder how long it's going to be before we all realize that. That really yeah. it is the elite people who have all the money and resources versus the poor people who don't. Because that seems to be the real disparity rather than yeah. anything else. Yeah, there's there's an important part of uh, our history that's not told enough um, around Bacon's Rebellion. Um, long story short, um, I should know his first name, <laughs> uh, uh, what Bacon's first name was. But this white guy named Bacon was tired of uh, the governor of Virginia. I think his, uh, I forget his first name, but his last name was Berkeley. Um, and he teamed up with other poor whites and indentured and enslaved Africans and, you know, went to war and had a rebellion against these rich white folks because they were all dirt poor and not being treated right. There are different levels of not being treated right, but they were all not being treated right. So what they decided to do was, you know what, like, we can't have this happen again. We're going to make explicit white rules and black rules, right, to make sure that this doesn't ever happen again. Um, And you eloquently put it like that, that program and that, that encouraging, that, that system that's set up in that uh, way we're encouraged to think, or white folks are encouraged to think, around like, I can always, I, I have some more privilege here on this level, man, I can always possibly get to that super high level, right? It, it went all the way up to 45 because the very people that supported 45 probably didn't get a lot from 45, <clears throat> um, right? But, you know, he, he tapped into their uh, emotions and and their, their uh, psychological misprogramming <laughs> to, 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 you know, get power gave him his mm-hmm. power, um, even triggered them to storm a capital. And now some of them might be facing charges and here Trump is still <laughs> not going to court. 
right? right. Um, and, and that's not even, and, and, and again, that even speaks to privilege because, yeah, some of them are be going to court, but can you imagine what would have happened if that was black people <laughs> that ran up on that Capitol? There wouldn't be some people going to court. There'd be a lot of jail time immediately, <laughs> right? And no bail immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and, and let me step back for just a minute and make very yeah. clear that there is a difference between poor white people in the 1700s and slaves. I, I don't want to make it Absolutely. seem like I was yeah, saying yeah, yeah. that they're the same thing. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah they're yeah, absolutely no, not. But yeah. to your point, too, though, if, yes, if if uh, black and brown people did what those white people did, forget about jail time. How many would be killed? Yeah. Before you even got to court, before you get to the no bail, before you get thrown into prison, how many of those people would have been killed? Yeah. 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 And and maybe not just maybe not even just by the cops that were burying the building, but like some MAGA bro or proud boy that might have been counter protesting. They're like, you can't do that. You know, like whatever they do. So there's a lot of um, double standards. And even with like the and I was talking with my friend about the Waco thing because he was giving me more information about it that I didn't understand. Um, But like, even that, while that is a situation that, you know, like the federal government also wasn't, didn't have their hands clean in that, um, they were doing a lot. (laughs) These Waco people, right? But, But like Panthers had been, had, had they places shot at, blown up without doing any of the things that the Waco people did, right? Um, and actually, when you watch Judas and the Black Messiah, you'll see that. Um, um, so, and even the MOVE people, MOVE um, and kind of like, not like Waco, but like MOVE was a, a situation in Philadelphia where it was like almost like a commune that was happening in the city of Philadelphia, right? Um, no no actual issues or or, or, or traumatizing kind of religious type of deals going on, right? Um, nothing mm-hmm. to the extreme that was happening in Waco, but the the, mayor, uh, the uh, Philadelphia Police Department and the federal government bombed that place. They bombed, they bombed yes. like city blocks, right? Yep. Um, that's where Mumia Abu-Jamal, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that name, but like he's probably one of the more famous political prisoners, like, but that's that's the movement that he came out of, and they, they straight up bombed that place without doing half the crazy stuff that Waco was doing. So it, it, there's a lot of, um, and all of this is before Donald Trump, you know, and yeah. that's, that's the yeah. point, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so. There's a legacy. This isn't, this didn't mm-hmm. just pop up in 2016. There's a, there's a legacy. There's a lineage of this stuff. And, and the more that you pointed out, yeah, you're right. Like the Waco thing probably isn't a fair comparison. Um, yeah, but I got because, what you were yeah, saying. Yeah. At the end of the day, if if people don't like what's happening, you know, regardless, especially politically, right? And that's where a lot of, of and again, I don't have a ton of depth of knowledge with this, but when it comes to, to black social movements, that's what it feels like is happening. Like, oh, no, 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 there's too much happening here. We need to find a way to shut it down, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and unfortunately, that ends up being, uh, you know, people die. I mean, there's no yeah. other way to put it. People unfortunately die for those particular causes, which is scary. That's scary. scary. It's a wild thing to have to think about. So if I talk about pushing into today, right, with everything that is happening, what is it that people like me who, you know, I have some familiarity. I grew up on, for the first half of my childhood, I grew up on Locust Street next to Dewey and Emerson. I went to school number 34. Yeah. Okay. Then my parents were fortunate enough to find a way to move out to the suburbs. And I, the second half of my childhood was in Spencerport. But what is it that people like me might be missing about these movements, whether it's be, whether it's uh, black lives matter, whether it's personally here with, with uh, Daniel Prude here in Rochester, what is it that not only are we missing, but maybe that we could do that is supportive, but not um, invasive or intrusive, if that's an appropriate word. Talk to your people, bro. <laughs> that's that. That's my most simple answer. Um, I think that as somebody, and based on our conversation, there's just some assumptions I'm making, but I think that somebody who um, is curious, asking questions, following up, 
with those uh, the answers through reading things, exploring things. When you hear somebody at Thanksgiving or somebody at your job or somebody in your community say certain things, operate with the same kind of curiosity around why they think that way and then explore or put them onto other facts around that situation. Not even other facts, just facts, <laughs> right? In, in, in some occasions, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and posing questions to them around why they think the way they think and, and pushing them into thinking about it, right? I, I don't know if uh, going like stereotypically white woke at the Thanksgiving table is the most helpful version of it, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like, how dare you vote for a Trump granddad? They're racist. Like that doesn't, that doesn't work necessarily yeah. either, but like actually having the, the probing kind of questions um, to really pick apart their thinking and help them understand how illogical racism really is with some of the things you brought up around, you know, Rage Against Machines showing white was an invention. What was it invented for? <laughs> right. And what were all the reasons it was invented for, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and just illustrating how illogical racism is through your own experiences, through the facts you read. Um, and I think that's the most helpful thing that a, a white person can do is talk to their own folks around these, these issues. Um, because conversation is a large reason why Trump got elected. It's not the only reason, right? Sure. I mean, the lack of conversation is is one reason why Trump got elected. You can't tell me that the people who voted for Trump didn't have white family members who could have been having more serious conversations around their crazy ideas, right? Um, so I, I, I think that's the most meaningful thing, for sure. And, and before would, you yeah, ask a black person or a person of color, um, unless it's like a podcast like this, sure, right? sure. Um, and or, or you already have like a really trusted, trusted like you know relationship with uh, a person. Yeah, a good of color. rapport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't don't use a person of color for your racial therapy, <laughs> right? Like, speak to other. What does that mean? So, so use other white folks who are on a racial uh, racial reckoning journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for lack of better terms, to ask questions um, to, as opposed to potentially harming or getting on uh, the nerves of <laughs> a person of color when you ask a, a, a simple question, right? Like I, I'm trying to think of a good example. Mm -hmm. So for me, right? Yeah. There are things I don't get about the LBGTQ plus community still. I'm still learning sure. about or that 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 movement, that that way of living, that way of being, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't run to any of my LBGTQ plus friends with really silly questions that may hurt their feelings because they have to navigate that stuff all the time. And here I am, supposed to be their friend, and I'm asking them simple questions like, um, "What? Why is why?" Uh, I don't understand pronouns. Like why? Why do? Why do these pronouns? Da 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 da. Right? They have to navigate that stuff all the time. Like so, to be burdened with me asking these simple, rudimentary questions is a, is a lot, right? Um, mm. But if I ask my sister, who is not in that community but knows more and has done more learning first, then I can, you know, ask her without necessarily. Uh, harming or doing a microaggression towards uh, anybody from the LBGTQ plus community. Yeah, does that never, make sense? It, it does. I've never thought in it that way. I've never yeah. like really taken the time to think about how my questions might, you know, impact somebody because I always come from the thought process of me asking questions is a genuine curiosity because I want to know about more about you. It's not yeah. a harmful or, or it's not intended to be a harmful you know, uh, prodding, if you will, of somebody who's not me. That's never yeah. the intent. But I, I could see how that might be taken in a different light. And I've never thought about it that way. So I appreciate you putting that kind of into context for me. Yeah, and again, no I've never thought about it that way. And, and I want to be careful again, because 
asking questions. I, I don't want to make it seem like you can't ask nobody that's not like you questions. That's not necessarily, sure. but just having some mindfulness of like, you know what, like, you know, maybe I can just ask this of another person because th this person who experiences these things, it, it just may not be a good time or a good way to bring it up with them. There's somebody in my community that knows a little bit more that I can reach out to. Um, yeah, just because, yeah, no, there, there are black people and people of color in general that, um, that can get tired <laughs> of being the ask the person of color kind of person, right? Um, yeah. Especially when, yeah, yeah, especially when they have, again, deal with the thing that you're not understanding on a very regular basis. But there's also honor in not knowing something and asking somebody who does know about it, right? So it's just about having discernment, I guess, you know? So, yeah, I think it's also about having context as well. Like, yes. if, like the more I'm thinking about, it, the more, if I could put it into my own context is, so I, I am a kid of two deaf parents, so I'm fluent in American Sign mm -hmm. Language. And growing up, whenever anybody found that out, the first thing they would do is give me the bird because that that's here's the sign language wow. I know. And it's wow. like, that's like nice. that's not funny anymore. I've heard that 74 yeah. times. So if I use that as my frame of reference, I could see why, you know, coming to somebody and asking a question might be like, bro, I've answered this like 70 times. I'm, I'm done. Ask yeah. somebody else. So that makes sense to me when I yep, put it into exactly. that framework. So. That yep, makes sense. Yep, and, I, and I would hope that, you know, when we all ask questions of each other, we're doing it with, um, you know, the facial expressions and the tones of somebody who's trying to be respectful. And, and at the same time, even if you're asking that respectful question, also know that this person's a human being. They might have just gotten a fight with their spouse yesterday and they might be, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, heated from that. And they don't have they don't want to deal with this because they're already pissed. So that makes total sense. And I appreciate you kind of you know, uh, opening that up for me. No. Let me turn this into a bit more of a, of a lower, you know, grade. Cause we talk about uh, race and politics and it can be aggressive for a lot of people. But the one thing I've yeah. always found interesting is there's so many connections. It feels like, and actually in your name, right? Bushido is a Japanese term. What is yes. the connection for somebody like myself with um, maybe Asian context or culture and black culture because there's so many things i feel like i could point to like like the the black dragon and uh shadow dogs is a is a a movie uh that you is it shadow dogs oh, ghost dog ghost dog ghost dog thank you ghost yes. dog yep. and yep. the boondocks like there's so many yeah. of of cross section of those two things what is it that that fascinates people uh to go in that direction um that's a that's a good question i think um there's a there's a Netflix movie that explains it actually pretty well. I think it's called like Fast Fists and Kung Fu Flicks or something like that. Okay. Um, I forget what it's technically called. I can look it up in a moment. But <clears throat> it does a good job explaining what was happening in New York City all at the same time. One, um, oppression, right? 1970s, mm -hmm. the Bronx and just New York City just was just a hot mess. Just for black yeah, and brown the, folks, um, the introduction of crack and cocaine yeah, and exactly all, all those things just were destroying communities. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even before crack cocaine, just like allowing buildings to burn and heroin and uh, all all those things, like in the seventies leading up to eighties into crack cocaine, right? So yeah, there's okay, there's fair. the there's the um there's the housing discrimination, there's the the drug uh, pushing and discrimination. There's the um, political discrimination and at the same time, hip hop is being made. And at the same time, these Kung Fu movies are being flooded into New York City, particularly like a lot of the 42nd, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, uh, 42nd Street movie houses. Right. And if you ask the RZA from the Wu-Tang Clan, he talks about a lot about how when these movies came out, a lot of the philosophies and messages around oppression Right. Because a lot of these old school Kung Fu movies, they're ads to deal with, you know, some clan oppressing some group of people and then, you know, a member of that group of people, you know, training in some sort of montage uh, to, to then, you know, uh, get revenge 
against these 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 warring clans with the, the oppressive uh, regime, right? And that's a story that Black and Brown people, um, when I say Black and Brown, like people of African and or Latinx descent can relate to, right? And like, when you just look at the deeper history of martial arts, like there really isn't a lot radically different from like what you see with African martial arts and like uh, Asian uh, martial arts. And in both of those is a huge spectrum, right? But like- right. There's just this there there aren't the there aren't the the gaps of like cultural gaps that people would believe or uh, you know or assume right um you know so just even the idea around like kung fu it was it was it was something that migrated over to places like China right when when it came from out of like you know places like darker places like India and, and other places like there's a what's that man's name. I think his name is um, Damu. He was a um, an Indian Buddhist who basically had like a prototypical kind of kung fu or martial arts style. Took it into uh, far eastern Asia, and it kind of evolved from there. Um, so, and I definitely got to make sure I got that name right um, because if somebody hears this, like this dude, what are we talking about? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to look it up, but it looks like it is Damo, Damu. D A M U. Yes, Damo. Yep. Damo. Mm-hmm. Damo. Yep. Damo. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. <clears throat> I've never thought about how how closely related the hierarchical structure of cultures is in like old. Uh, I'm going to use the wrong terms here, but like uh, a martial arts school against another martial arts school. You know, and you have. Um, not just in, in, well, I mean, it would be Native American as well. You have a chief and you have a structure in which people fall under that hierarchy and there is mm-hmm. an allegiance to your school or your tribe or your group or your whatever that, you know, de- de- uh, title would be and that matching in. That's interesting. Yeah. I'll have to, what's that? Fast, fast flicks, I think it was, hopefully. Uh, fast fists and kung fu flicks. I'm, I'm going to look that up right now. But yeah, there's, there's, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of common denominators in Asian, Indigenous, Latinx, and African, uh, uh, cult, African-derived cultures, mm-hmm. right? Um, in terms of, um, in terms of certain values, um, in terms of certain uh, ways to look at the world and the cosmos, right? And all those things can manifest differently through, you know, language and food and, 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 and you know. Uh, self-defense <laughs> right like so um so so and there's actually a movie called black kung fu experience too that talks a bit about like some of the african roots of martial arts right and when you see these dudes getting busy um again it doesn't look radically different uh, getting busy in traditional african martial arts styles it doesn't look radically different um, you know, and even like a thing like capoeira, right? Like where uh, it, it was this uh, dance slash martial arts, it was a martial arts form, an African martial arts form made in Brazil during chattel slavery. But obviously slave masters weren't trying to see uh, their slaves, you know, practice martial arts. So they just disguised it as dance, right? Like, and if you are, are a product of the 90s and 2000s like I am, you'll remember Eddie Gordo from Tekken. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. And that that was that's capoeira, right? Like it's it's extremely African, but it's extremely martial arts like, right? Like so, <clears throat> um, there's just a lot of overlap, um, and so you see that all the time in hip hop, um, uh, and you know Wu Tang are like the vanguard of of doing that and doing that very uh, expertly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now that I think about it, I, that that was probably not a good question as far as getting away from the cultural or or things like that but either way i appreciate you you know taking the time and answering some of my silly questions um what's the next project for you is it is it obviously you've got your albums coming out in the summer hopefully yes yep um and by the way the movie is called iron fists and kung fu kicks iron fist that's what it's called iron fists and kung fu kicks all right got it yep that's what it's called um really good movie but uh, so for the summer, um, 
trying to put out two uh, albums. One of them is called 30 Rock, um, which has been in development for a while. And then another is called, um, for now, I'm calling it Sorry Bill, I'll Pass, a COVID journal, right? Um, which is stuff that's been uh, accumulating over the course of us going through this pandemic. Um, a lot of reflections on our, our, our environment and my own personal environment during, you know, uh, this, this national and global environment. So I'm looking forward to those coming out. Actually, how you MAGA, the how you MAGAs are going to be on that particular uh, uh, COVID project. So looking forward to it. Um, you know, a lot of similar kind of commentary um, and some of the lyrical approaches uh, that we have talked about will be present on both of these projects. So I'm looking, looking forward to releasing it and, and sharing it and having people, you know, uh, pick it apart. And yeah. It, it, and, yeah. Yeah. It'll be exciting. It'll be, it'll be really cool to see. Um, do you think you would ever, I know you've done a couple of blog posts. Do you think you would ever write anything, whether it's like an article or a book or something to that effect? Do you think that's something in your future maybe that you uh, would consider doing or is being a lyricist really just the the bread and butter of what you like to do? No, no, I, I can see myself writing um, a, a, a book at some point. Um, I've, you know, I, I've, my website has a blog, but I'm intentionally kind of brief with what I share because of people's mm-hmm. time and my time, but I also still want to make sure it's functional and useful. Um, and before that, I took, I, I had a, a blog for BushidoGarby.com that I'll regularly write in. But outside of those things, I, I would anticipate releasing some poetry or maybe a, a book about education. Um, but that's, that, that isn't in the uh, radar yet. It's like right outside the radar and, you know, in time mm-hmm. when some of these other things are taken care of it's on that and bucket list on the radar you know for sure <laughs> well uh brandon I, I appreciate all the time that you've spent with me um especially towards the end of the conversation putting into context like how we ask questions i appreciate that and i hope that uh that i wasn't too offensive or, or did anything no. to kind of throw you off during this conversation. So, but I, I appreciate it either way. I look forward to your projects coming out. Um, and, and as always, I, I look forward to uh, making sure that I keep in touch with you and, and seeing what else you're working on in the future, man. Mm, thank you, bro. I appreciate that. Um, you know, great job with this podcast, man. Like, great questions, good conversation. I look forward to seeing more. All right. Thank you so much, man.